Hey everyone, it's John. Uh, it's been a while since I've done a video. It's been pretty crazy uh, work-wise. Uh, and I wanted to do something uh, kind of quick and low-key. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping to get more stuff out, more simulations. Um, some Junosphere stuff, a review of Junosphere with some lab equipment. But right now, I, I wanted to take a look at this drawing here. Uh, I threw this together really quick. I think there's enough stuff in here that most people will recognize pieces of their own network in it. You have several data centers for sake of simplicity. I added two. You have some type of WAN slash ring uh, connecting your main data centers. It could be high-speed point-to-point links. It could be an OC whatever, uh, but a high-speed ring. You have some larger offices hanging off your 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 back your, your WAN backbone that are uh, you know too remote to be on your high-speed ring, but are still plenty fast enough. Uh, that they're be you know they're considered high speed. They're just not super high speed. Uh, this could be a large remote office, you know, across the country, across the continent, across the world, and then some smaller offices that may not even have separate cores. They may just have stuff like um, a stack. And those offices may be in very remote places that are way too expensive to bring circuits directly back to your data center, and you may just hang those off your existing office and. Uh, You'll see everything's connected with OSPF. You have OSPF between your cores. Uh, your entire backbone is all area zero like it should be. Uh, you have areas inside each site as it should be, so you can keep all your, uh, you know, keep your backbone area zero free from all your other routers. And then you can have summaries from each area with the area, you know, summarize all the routes in every, in every area so you can reduce the size of your, your routing table. And then I threw in a BGP cloud over here for VPN. So if you have any dual, uh, dual home VPN concentrators where you have uh, you know, two sites with two VPN concentrators and you have redundant VPN tunnels back uh, and you're using BGP for routing, uh, you know, so, and those could be 100 offices, 200 offices, 500 offices, 10 offices, it really doesn't matter. And then the VPN concentrators participate in, in the OSPF uh, uh, inside the area for each data center or site. Uh, so this is pretty much, uh, I think, a fairly representative diagram of most people's environment. Uh, yours could be smaller or larger, uh, depending on, on your specific situation. And I want to talk about how this is kind of an older paradigm, and, and, and uh, it's a classical design that is a little bit older, and there's some limitations with it, and I want to talk briefly about that. So the first limitation is that if you're not able to summarize well, because like most companies, you've had you know, quick acquisitions, you've had stuff dumped in data centers, you've had office moves, uh, and you've had, you know, servers where the server guys just didn't know how to change the IP or was an odd application owner or a giant application where, you know, there's one guy that manages and he's not very good or he's not around or the guy doesn't even work here anymore, any number of issues. And so, you know, the company thought it was too risky to change IPs when they moved. So you moved the whole subnet with it. There's lots of reasons you could have uh, for having mixed subnets of different buildings and not being able to summarize well. And I think most companies probably fall into this category. And if you're in that category, because a lot of what we do as network guys is, is dependent on other teams and their availability and their knowledge and their uh, support. So uh, I think it's fairly common that, that you're going to have pretty messy address space unless you're extremely lucky. You might not, you know... If you build a new center from the ground up, you might be able to summarize all the subnets there. But if anything gets moved to it, chances are, no matter how much you kick and scream, you're going to have something that's going to be not quite fitting within your nice, beautiful classless design. So if you can't summarize, and you're like most of us, you're, you're you know, there's a small section of data centers here, but you could have 20 data centers on this ring or 40. You could have a lot more. And all the access layer stuff is in here as well. Instead of one VPN concentrator at each site, you could have 10 VPN concentrators at each site doing different stuff. One could just do partners. One could just do uh, your own remote offices. One could do third-party stuff. You could have additional routers for partners, PLS links, private, all kinds of stuff, frame relay even. Who knows? Uh, so obviously this is a very pared-down diagram. I tried to put a little bit of everything in here to sort of uh, make it somewhat to what you're going to see out there, what you have seen or something similar to your network. I tried to follow best practices as well as can be expected, you know, in the real world here. So this is what you end up with. And because of that, uh, you know, if you're big enough, OSPF is going to have issues when you start getting thousands and thousands of routes to the table. 
Uh, because the more routes you have in the table, doesn't matter what area they're in, uh, if you can't summarize, the more the smaller the networks, that if you can't summarize between areas and you have a lot of small networks, like a lot of slash 24s or even smaller, if you have any flaps of those networks anywhere in your environment, an SPF calculation is run everywhere. So that's a problem. So if you have these remote, these remote offices and they're slash 24s, let's say, and one of the redundant tunnels goes down and the route disappears from one zone, or both go down because the internet at the site went down, you lose both tunnels and the routes disappear from both areas, you're going to get SPF recalculations. And SPF recalculations, there is some latency as fast as OSPF is to converge, and those calculations take resources. And the more routes you have, the more calculations take place, the longer they take to finish, and you can have issues with your routing stability because of that. So that is one of the areas where OSPF kind of has some issues, and, and EIGRP, as much as I hate to support proprietary protocols with its feasible successors, it has pre-calculated that for you, so it doesn't suffer nearly as much. However, EIGRP has other issues, such as link state flooding of information between all the routers within a site. It's not nearly as efficient as OSPF with the multiple areas. So, you know, it's, it's tit for tat, I guess, as far as, uh, as what you have. Uh, to deal with with the two different protocols, but anyways, that's there are some scaling limitations to OSPF. Beyond purely scaling limitations, there are some issues with if you want to move to an MPLS design because you want enhanced quality service on your backbone, you want to do traffic engineering tunnels with dedicated bandwidth for certain applications. Uh, you want to be able to uh, set up MPLS level uh, layer three VPNs across your backbone to. Uh, isolate customers or environments and keep them separate and let them have small pockets in multiple data centers. You're going to need MPLS. If you want to, um, you know, go to a VRF light model and then you decide, you know, you want to apply some kind of QoS or settings to that, you know, these, these, some of these things OSPF does not handle uh, the greatest, even with its support for traffic engineering and MPLS and fast reroute and all that. They're, they're, there just are some limitations where it doesn't perform as well as, as a, maybe a different option, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, you know, uh, now you have SDN coming on the scene, open flow. There's a lot of talk about overlay networks like VXVLAN and, uh, and next generation GRE and all these things. Uh, and essentially there, you know, there's even more stuff that's going abstracted that's on top. Uh, uh, of your environment and you may want the ability to apply really granular routing policies or keep track of certain things or provide feedback loops like BFD between your overlay and your underlay and, and, and things like that and uh, OSPF while a great routing protocol it converges really fast uh, usually unless you have too many routes or too many routers in a site you know more than 50 routers in a site I believe was the old recommendation not sure how current that is with modern gear I guess it would depend on how many routes you have in your table and how often you're doing SPF recalculations, but essentially there are some limitations to this. Um, and and there's some there's some options. So uh, let me turn the page here and we'll talk about uh, an alternate design and some of the choices you have with that design and where I've made specific choices and why uh, and what my goals are and where you can make different choices that are equally as valid but is a sort of a different take on on, on this on, you know on on poor routing for the 21st century I guess in the enterprise uh, so let's uh, let's go to the next page okay I'm going to let you take a look at this for a second essentially what you're looking at is a moving all of your routing to BGP and if you're not familiar with BGP if you haven't used it a lot BGP is Definitely not just for internet connections or external links. It can fail over extremely fast if tuned correctly. Uh, it's meant uh, to to have uh, tremendous amounts of policy control if you're talking about eBGP or fast failover and support for all kinds of advanced MPLS and overlay uh, environments if you're talking about iBGP. And it scales extremely well. There is no uh, uh, SPF calculations associated with this. Uh, so essentially, uh, it's a very nice solution. Um, now, 
what I've chosen to do here is to uh, use out of band IBGP route reflectors. Um, and then essentially they don't participate. Uh, uh, they're not, they're, the route reflector is not running on your cores where the rest of the BGP sessions are. Uh, and so you see I've added separate route reflectors. Now you could have taken your layer three cores in each site and you could have added route reflectors to each one of these and made them a cluster. In each site, you have a different cluster. It's important when you're doing for redundancy that you have a separate route reflector cluster at each site. You don't want to have them in the same cluster because you can run into routing loops if there's a WAN failure. Uh, additionally, OSPF should only have loopbacks and WAN links. You know, basically, loopbacks and the physical interfaces connecting the router should be all that's in your OSPF routing table. You should have, for the most part, on your backbone routers, BGP not running, and IBGP on your cores basically linking to your route reflectors. Now, there is some stuff left out of this diagram for the sake of clarity, and because there's so many little lines running around the diagram, I thought it would be more clear. Uh, so, for instance, the layer 3 cores in each site, they need to connect to each route reflector, not just the one in their local site, but I didn't want a bunch of lines running back and forth. The route reflectors themselves need to peer with each other as well, uh, and that's the dotted line you see going between the sites. Um, additionally, I've made some choices here specifically because I'm looking at running um, more towards an SDN, MPLS, and the data center type environment. So I wanted to make sure my high speed data centers are running IBGP between them, and this is going to uh, uh, this is going to allow us to do some advanced stuff like traffic engineering tunnels, layer 3 MPLS VPNs, layer 2 MPLS VPNs such as eVPN, uh, VPLS between sites. It's going to allow you to do really granular traffic engineering. It's going to allow you to, um, to use OSPF for your next top resolution and fail over really, really fast. Uh, especially with there is some options you can use to tie BGP to OSPF such as um, uh, there's commands to make sure that OSPF that OSPF is fully operational and peered before BGP comes online to prevent the routing loops. Uh, you can use BFD to make sure that uh, BGP routes go down immediately if there's a connection failure. Uh, so there, there's there's some choices here that I made to keep IBGP within uh, all my data centers, my high speed data centers on IBGP in the same AS. Now. You'll notice that the VPNs are now all eBGP because I want to do that rich uh, policy control with communities and, and and all that good stuff. And and you definitely want eBGP for policy control. That's what it, that's where it shines. Uh, also, my remote large offices that are on fast links but not super fast links, such as you know, this could be uh, an office in uh, you know Shanghai or Japan or somewhere, uh, another part of China, you know somewhere in Europe or Russia or North Africa, where Links are expensive and they're high speed, but not really high speed. EBGP, because you want to keep, you know, you may want to be doing summaries there at the EBGP level. You may want to make sure that any instability that happens in those remote sites doesn't spill across into your main sites, and you may want to do dampening and other things for routes. So EBGP definitely there. Um, EBGP on your VPN cloud. Uh, if you had 20 more large remote offices that aren't listed here, by all means, eBGP between those and your main backbone. Um, your smaller offices, like the one below the remote large office, where essentially uh, it may be too expensive to have that come all the way back to America or Europe, wherever your main data center is, uh, you can hang that with OSPF off of, a, off of the nearest large office, and basically OSPF will... You can put those routes into BGP when you eBGP advertise back, or you can use eBGP summaries to advertise back, you know, with the summary or aggregate commands. So you can have islands of OSPF, you know, that are discontinued, that they're disconnected, and your your main routing protocol is iBGP. OSPF only provides next hop resolution. The other thing you want to make sure of is that your routers are running uh, next hop self on your iBGP connection, so that if you you don't have to worry about any issues associated with next hop you know, next hop resolution from IBGP point of view, especially if using route reflectors. And the routes they come from odd protocols and places. You just don't want any issues with that. Um, 
The nice thing about this is you can set the admin distance to be really high for BGP and you can migrate to it slowly over time. Uh, once BGP is fully populated, you can basically reduce the admin distance so it takes effect over OSPF and then if everything is fine, you can remove all the network statements out of OSPF except for the loopbacks and the physical WAN links. Uh, and basically you've completely converted to an iBGP core with BGP, uh, external BGP for your different areas. Uh, again, you could run an equally, uh, uh, an equally uh, good design is to run eBGP between all your data centers. Uh, that's really good if you want to have a lot of policy control, you want to make sure instability doesn't spill across different data centers, and you, your main goal uh, is rock solid BGP routing. However, that doesn't place you very well for MPLS and SDN and some of those advanced things. So uh, I would, uh, that's why I've chosen a hybrid design where you have IBGP within your main fast centers and eBGP to the other centers just because uh, I don't want eGP connecting to a site where I want to run a, I want to run some kind of advanced MPLS because it's, while it's not impossible, you can exchange uh, layer 3 MPLS VPNs and layer 2 MPLS VPNs between AS numbers. It is not as easy as, as straightforward as within a single AS. So, and there's a lot of caveats you have to, uh, caveats you have to watch out for. Uh, so, that's why I've chosen this design. Uh, again, the redundant connections are missing just because I didn't want the diagram to be any more messy. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a ton of questions about this. If there's any questions, please ask. I'm trying to get more involved with the channel. Again, I've just been extremely busy. I, I want to lab this up in Junosphere and do a review of Junosphere and a review of this design. Um, so I hope to do that soon. Uh, I know there's been some questions uh, on some of the other videos that I haven't got to. If you're still out there, uh, you know, assuming you're still subscribed and you assume I haven't died or anything, ask the questions again. I'll try to make a list of, uh, of things to do uh, and become more active. It's just been extremely busy. Uh, the last couple of years I've, I've been working for a pretty exciting place that's extremely busy and uh, hasn't left me a lot of free time to do these kind of tutorials. So um, I'm hoping that even though this is not really a console-based tutorial, that there's enough food for thought here from a design perspective to get your mind turning and asking questions and, and, and really make you look at your routing in a whole different way. Uh, there's a great Cisco press book. Uh, uh, advanced BGP design that's amazing I'm not sure if it's still in print I have an older version uh, it's all about BGP there's an equally great Cisco press book uh, advanced MPLS concepts that's really really good as well the two of those together have a lot of overlapping content uh, and they will turn you into a BGP ninja in your own right um, like I said I have the older my copies of the books are six to six to eight years old so I'm sure there's new new versions uh, but uh, I reference those books almost all the time uh, and lately uh, personally I've been embracing BGP quite a bit more uh, it's sort of taken over without us really realizing in a couple of the places that I've uh, been employed and with good reason it, it just works extremely well it's extremely uh, solid from a policy perspective to control routes gives you a lot of flexibility it doesn't have a lot of the scaling limitations of some of the other protocols uh, and if tuned properly and if thought out well uh, it's a very solid design. So, like I said, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's food for thought. You have a lot of questions, uh, and and you know, or critiques, and uh, and we can have sort of a discussion about it. Maybe that'll lead into another video. Uh, if you all want to see uh, a review of Junosphere, uh, and if you want to see a review of this sort of topology inside Junosphere, let me know. Uh, I'll work on. It. I'll try to get a video out for that for everybody. But. Uh, Anyways, this has been sort of a little food for thought tidbit. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I, I hope to have more stuff soon. Take care.